Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis, a podcast dedicated to the Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell case. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Happy Monday, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well out there. We wanted to hop on and do a quick little podcast about the speculation surrounding a plea deal for Lori. Now, let's just say this is all speculation. Yeah. Like almost this whole thing is just not all of it, but some of it is just giving you a this could happen, this could happen, could. And our disclaimer at the beginning is no, we do not think she's getting off. Nope. Nor is Chad. Nope. We're just going to give you some ins and outs and what could happen. Just give you some thoughts to think on. Yeah. So before we start talking about all that um we are going to start giving some shout outs to some of our twitter followers and we have a lot of really fun people following us on twitter and the conversation kind of goes all day and all evening um so we want to say hey to mikhail jan stephanie and crime and all yeah that it's uh you guys know a lot of stuff and ask some good questions and yes the comments conversations and- really really fun Um, so we know that duct tape is going to come in in a big way in this case and garbage bags. And, um, we've watched some, some shows. I'm a forensic files. Um, I go down that rabbit hole every evening, just about when I'm laying in bed and can't sleep. And there have been so many of those cases on that show that involve duct tape and garbage bags. And it kind of seems to be the one surefire way to tie yourself to a crime scene. Yeah, like, duct tape is forensic gold. Oh, yeah. Um, It just sucks up everything, catches everything. Yeah, it just seems like it's impossible to not get any evidence on duct tape. From the time you rip it off the roll to the time you uh, put it on the body and the time you dispose of it, however you're going to dispose of it. Yeah, um, and it's made up of different things, uh, different fibers, and, um, you know, you have, like, the adhesive, and then you have, like, the weave of the fibers that they, you know, share whatever, um, and all, and then the content of those fibers and stuff, so. Yeah, I, I mean, almost every other episode that I watch, um, involves duct tape in some ways. And it's crazy because the one I was watching last night, there was a case where somebody had used duct tape and the duct tape had been submerged in water for quite a while. And they were still able to pull that out of the water, get fingerprints and like uh, cotton fibers from clothing. Yeah. It's like waterproof almost. Yeah. um, You know, duct tape hurts. (laughs) It does. I've had some mishaps with duct tape. It's um, you know, it's strong stuff. I, I mean, you just experimented with some duct tape. So why don't you tell us what you found? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're trying to determine. Okay, if they use gloves, you know, what would happen? Whatever. So I put on some rubber gloves, and we know all in this pandemic, everybody's got rubber gloves. So, um, so we put on gloves and attempted to tear duct tape and pull it and with the amount of duct tape they use there's no way they use gloves yeah because it was so it was a pain it would stick to the glove and then you pull it and it would rip and you know it's just different there's no way yeah um you would have to think that at some point with the the amount of duct tape that they found on jj um, that if they did use gloves, at some point, I would feel like it. there's a good possibility. If they use gloves, it would have ripped that glove and gotten some DNA on there. Yeah. And I took my gloves off and I used barehanded. And it's still sticky, but it's it's easier to use barehanded. And plus, I mean, I showed you, like, I touched the duct tape and you immediately, all we did was turn it over and took our uh, light on our cell phone and you could see a clear fingerprint. Yeah, you're busted. Yeah, you're in trouble. Got your print right so there. So then, too, during all that, you have them standing over. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
you have uh, dead skin cells that could come off, um, hair. We watched one where the lady was found guilty because her fingernail, part of her fingernail polish, yeah, was on the duct tape. Yep. It, yeah, and they were able to find the duct tape in this woman's house. I mean, I, I'm sorry, not the duct tape. The fingernail polish was sitting on her bedside. Yeah. They were able to put that under a microscope, and they found that the killer, um, just she, obviously she didn't know it, but her fingernail polish is the reason she got life in prison. So I think I'm just, I really, really can't wait to see the uh, physical evidence that they have. Um, because you have to think about it in a moment like this, where you have killed a kid and you are trying to wrap the body up, there has to be some adrenaline. I would almost guarantee probably Alex was sweating or Lori or whoever, Chad, I, we, we just don't know at this point who did what we, we have an idea of where they were where JJ was killed, which is probably in the townhouse. But, you know, there's a chance that their hair is somewhere within that duct tape, skin cells, fingerprints, carpet fibers from the townhouse, the car. I just feel like we're going to get some good answers of who was at least involved of wrapping the body due to forensic evidence. Yeah. And... Before everybody starts like, oh, wait, you said he was killed in the townhouse and da-da-da-da-da. I mean, we we don't know that for sure, but obviously it had to be somewhere. We don't know if it was Lori's or Alex's or yeah, I read whatever. A, I read a theory today. A lot of people still think she was killed in Yellowstone. I don't think I agree with that. I just think it's too risky for that long drive back to right. And it's not super long, but when you have a body in the car... Um, I just don't know. I mean, look, they're stupid criminals. I don't know if they're that stupid. Yeah, the chan- the uh, the odds of getting pulled over or something. and Or having an accident. Yeah. I mean, what if you have a bad accident and then you have a body in the car? Yeah. I just don't feel like that they transported the remains any more than they had to. Yeah, and, my, and we talked about this on the last podcast, and it was just one of our theories was uh, the fact that Lori makes the excuse that next morning with David that, oh, the the deal about J.J., you know, making, uh, being out of control and slapping, you know, the picture off the refrigerator and all that stuff. Uh, And we just said, you know, did she make that excuse so she could cover up if they heard him in any way? So Yeah, and, you know, on a... a Slightly different topic, but not really. (laughs) You know how my brain works. I sort of think now that I've been thinking about, I think that maybe Melanie Gibb and David Warwick were sort of an alibi. The more I think about it, it almost seems like if, if they came in town and they can say, we went here, we went there, we did a podcast until midnight, I almost wonder if their visit wasn't calculated by Lori, Chad, and Alex to be an excuse. That's a I don't good know. thought. It's just a thought I had. Yeah. Um, so essentially what they're going to be doing is they're going to be looking at evidence too that they found in the townhouse. Did you find a half used roll of duct tape? Did you find the, uh, you know, the cardboard thing that's in the middle? Um, garbage bags are another source of big DNA evidence. Uh, they can be. Yeah, we talked about that. You know, like when you pull the bag and it's staticky, mm-hmm. like it picks up. Um, I'll just say if if we're like cleaning up hay, I've been, you know, around horses and stuff some. And if you're like cleaning up hay, like on the outside of the bag, the hay just sticks to it because of that static electricity. But also, too, with the patterns, um, if you hold a, a garbage bag up to the light, these flex bags especially, they have kind of a chevron pattern. Yep, I looked at mine last night. Did you really? Yeah, I did. (laughs) And, I mean, they can go back to the manufacturer. It's almost like a fingerprint, they say, um, these patterns on these garbage bags. So did they find, you know, half-used duct tape in that townhouse? Did they find the the box to the garbage bag? It's going to be very interesting when all this stuff comes out. Um, Even down to, what was it you were looking at, uh, the rip pattern on the duct tape. They can put those together. They try to do like a little puzzle. But here's the question. Is that why 
Alex's apartment was totally empty. It could be. I mean, maybe they just didn't want anything in there if, in fact, that's either where one or both were killed or uh, at least for J.J. um, to be prepared to be buried, I mean, to be wrapped up. Yeah, I just don't, I just don't think, I don't think they're smart enough to throw all that away. I don't think so either. Mm -mm. Um, So I I just think that um, we say that this case is going to be mostly digital, and I think it will be for the other deaths. I think maybe with J.J., at least J.J., um, there, I, I feel sure they'll find some kind of, of evidence on that tape or those bags that's going to tell at least maybe he was there. Um, the other thing, too, that I saw on the episode of Forensic Files, they were able to tell that the person who wrapped the duct tape was left-handed. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, so I don't... I, I, so I guess the way you wrap determines... Yeah, if you're left or right-handed. We, we said yeah. Lori was right-handed. I don't know about Alex or Chad. Yeah, but um, just it's in looking at her signature, that's what we assumed. Yeah, but it's really it's kind of interesting if you think about it that they can find these little things like that. Yeah, I mean, the the killer was left handed because of how the duct tape was wrapped. I mean, let this be a lesson that you never should kill anybody because they're gonna find you. Yeah, forensic science has like grown so much it's fascinating yeah and they can just just get all kind of evidence from stuff you don't even think about yeah so the other thing that we have talked about and i tweeted out a story from it was kstu which is i believe it's a local channel in either arizona or idaho i'm not sure which one and they were talking about could it be that maybe the reason Lori did not come to her preliminary hearing is that she is in the process of making a plea deal. And so we just want to say out of the gate, we said it at the beginning and we promised each other before we started doing this podcast tonight that we were going to remind everybody, this is speculation. There has been no movement from either side officially to tell us that that is what's happening. But you have to realize this happens all the time in cases like this, when you, especially when you have, like, co-conspirators. Yeah. Um, it, this case is, is different because it's in the media. It's sensationalized. People are COVID bored. I think that has been a lot of the reason this case is as big as it is. Yeah, if you think about it, too, every episode that you watch of any kind of crime, if there's two people involved, they always try to get the other one to roll on the other one. Right. So... They had Greg Rogers on, um, or they interviewed Greg Rogers on this KSTU. He's a retired FBI agent. And he says that um, what you need to do is you want to approach the one who was manipulated and make a deal with that person to flip on the other to get their testimony, which could solidify a much bigger charge against the co-conspirator than what they can get you on. So then you have to look at, okay, who was, who was taken advantage of, who was manipulated in this case? And you can kind of see it from both sides. Yeah. I, I, that's a big question of mine. Yeah. And I have theories to support both, but it's really hard to tell who was manipulated. Yeah. I mean, we know the past stuff that Lori's done uh, through her other marriages and whatever else. Um, uh, but we know she didn't commit murder in any of those. You know, Colby's her son. He's alive. I mean, Tylee lived till she was 16. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we know that aspect of it. Yeah. I, I, and then it could just be a case where nobody manipulated anybody. Yeah. I mean, it could just be. And I think that at the end of the day, both are evil. I think that we have two dead children and other dead adults. So I don't think there's any redemption with anybody. Um, but I've always sort of theorized maybe Chad influenced or manipulated Lori as sort of a brainwashing thing. But I, you know, the, the further we go along and especially after the Joe Ryan custody documents came out, I kind of changed my mind about that because she was so blatantly evil Yeah, in the approach to that. And I think if, when you mix that with Chad wanting to be this huge 
big person with this following, like, you know, like, Mm -hmm. I think when you mix all that together, that's when it gets uh, dangerous. Right. And I think if you look at Lori's past, I mean, she competed for Miss Texas or whatever that title was. She was on Wheel of Fortune. Um, I'd read that she wanted to be an actress or something when she was young. So it could be a situation where, to him, she starts reading his books, sees him as sort of a famous guy within that circle or within those belief systems, and then her need to be really important or big or this huge purpose, it could have just been a perfect union of crazy. Yeah. Oh, my, this guy who writes all these books and he's popular and... We were married in a past life. Oh, my god! Yeah, gosh. all this stuff. Oh, you know, yeah. This is a sign. So it just fed each other's ego and wanting to be. Um, I mean, you know, we dug through his book a little bit, and I'm still reading a little bit of it, but that just seems to be something that he was uh, a nobody, really, and um, liked all this fame and people following after him. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's obviously it was intoxicating to the both of them. And then you had these other people that were following that, I guess, from what it seems, looked at them like they were these prophets. I mean, Lori was the niece of Jesus, so. um, Yeah. (laughs) um, Okay. So, uh, you know, I think it's just one of those things. I I just, you know, just when you think you have this case figured out, and, and I'll be totally certain in a theory of mine, I think about it another way, and I'm like, we have no clue. Yeah. We really don't know at the end of the day what no, they were thinking. We don't know, but everybody that's following this case seems to think that they need to roll. One needs to roll on the other one. Oh, yeah. And I think when you take Alex out of the scenario, I think he possibly but it would have, you know, rolled. Sooner. Oh, I, I, I think so. Yeah. And we can't do that because he's now dead. Um, So... Yeah. They need, you know, you need somebody role to help with the, you know. Right. You've got to have somebody that's going to sing. Yeah. And um, like a canary. <laughs> but so when you're making a, I mean, so why would you offer a plea deal? Well, we don't know that Wood needs anybody to, to talk on the other. It seems like there's been an abundance of evidence left digitally. Yeah. But let's just theorize and say, okay, we're theorizing, guys. Don't lose it on Twitter at me. And okay. I just want to say real quick, don't forget what you're going to say. If we could have had this other trial, I mean, the other preliminary hearing, we could know some of this. Right. And you're it's exactly right. Irritating. Yeah. I mean, I think they would have had to have put something out there that showed that she was there or involved in some regard. Um, and, and that'll come out eventually. But so in theory, if Wood is going to make a plea deal with Lori, why would he need to do that? Well, for one, the way it was put, just be, just because the kids' bodies were on his property, it doesn't mean Chad murdered them. And I'm reading from somebody talking about this case. Yeah. Just because they were buried on his property, it doesn't mean he buried them. And it doesn't mean that he destroyed their bodies. This is from Mr. Shin. I'm sorry, I don't know a first name. So what they have to do is they have to prove that is to connect him to those bodies. Now, if Wood doesn't have that evidence readily available, it could be that they have a little less on Lori and they have more on Chad, but they really need her testimony to make murder charges stick. Yeah, and that's in the end, that's what we want. You want justice for everybody involved. Right, and and they just need a witness to get that murder charge, and at this point, the only one alive is Lori. She's the only one alive that, as far as we know, that knows what happened. I don't know about Melanie Pulowski. I mean, I'm sure she's been questioned, you know, up and down and around. Yeah. But as far as we know right now, Lori would be the only one alive that knew exactly what happened from the time the kids were killed until they were buried. Besides Chad. Besides Chad. But whoever flips, you know, the other knows, apparently. I don't even know why I didn't mention Chad, but I think it's just assumed, you know, he knows what happened. Um, But 
Greg Rogers, who is the retired FBI agent that talked to KSTU, he felt like waiving that preliminary hearing was calculated. Not just she didn't want to be on TV. She didn't want to sit for two days in this preliminary. His opinion, and we say opinion, was that maybe something bigger is in the works. Now, we again, we don't know. Yeah, because we know Lori's ego, and we know that this would have been after the July 22nd deal. Right. Yeah. But and then she would have had to, Kay and Larry were in there, so. Yeah, it, I, yep. I can't imagine sitting in a courtroom and having this all these conversations of, you know, lie after lie after lie, with everybody knowing the outcome. Yeah. Um, But, so what are... Why would Lori want to plea if, if theoretically this ever happened? Yeah. So, I mean, you look at reduction in charges and sentencing. Uh, she's been in there six months already. Right. And we discussed this is kind of a cakewalk compared to where she's going to end up. Oh, yeah. Um, so to avoid uh, publicity... Uh, resolves issue quickly instead of years long. So instead of taking so long um, to kind of get it over with. Yeah, you just plea. And, and and again, this is just how most cases, I mean, there are very few in, in, in the numbers of people awaiting trial, the number of people that actually go to trial is small. Most people take a plea. Even yeah. if there's not a co-conspirator, they just take a plea and say, so just for... You know, as an example, let's say somebody is charged with rape and then they talk to the, pro, you know, the lawyers talk, prosecutor talks to the defense attorney and they say, hey, if, if, if this person wants to take a, a plea, we'll put these charges down to aggravated assault or assault. So I'm not saying that that happens every day, but I mean, it kind of does. They just will make it more enticing for the defendant to take a little bit of a lesser charge and just avoid the trial. Yeah. Now. Um, for the prosecution, one of the things I think that has to be in the back of, of the prosecutor's mind is that juries are scary and they're unpredictable. Yeah. I mean, you take 12 people who are ordinary people like us, um, who may or may not be true crime followers. We don't know, uh, you know, in that area. What it's a lot of, I would assume it's a lot of farming, uh, different things like that. So, yeah, and we know there'll probably be a change of venue, but so just for comparison, let's look at the Casey Anthony trial. Um, I think Kaylee would have been 15. Yeah, it was the other day, today or yesterday, yesterday or something. I think it was yesterday. Okay, so everybody knows Kathy, Kate, uh, the, 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 my tongue has not got the. The memo that we're doing a podcast <laughs> at the Kathy. Okay. Uh, so Kaylee Anthony. All right. Here's how this sort of went down quickly. She was last seen on June 16th, 2008. She was not reported missing until July 15th by her grandma. And then on, so July 15th, the report is made July 16th. Casey Anthony is arrested for child neglect and giving false statements to police because she said she had left Kaylee with a babysitter. And then they send in the cadaver dogs to search Casey's car, and the dog picks up on decomposition in the trunk. And then they took air samples, which concluded there were human remains in the trunk. So they indicted her on capital mur- cap- uh, capital. Thank it's you capital. for the- You're welcome. Capital. Sorry, I'm a little flustered. Um, so they indicted her on capital murder, and she pled not guilty. In December, they found Kaylee's remains the prosecutor decides to seek the death penalty. So there was a defense put in place. And do you know that defense? Uh, Defense says that Kaylee drowned and that Casey lied because of her dysfunctional upbringing and sexual abuse by her father. So the defense going to trial did not say, oh, she didn't do it. She didn't do anything. They said this was a really bad accident. And because of, her you or her childhood, she lied. The evidence they had, they had um, hair from the trunk, they had chloroform detected in the trunk, and there was some uh, duct tape. Which, by the way, the duct tape, I did not follow this trial at all. 
Um, so I was really, I knew kind of the important parts of it, but they, ma- I, I believe they matched the duct tape found on Kaylee's mouth to the duct tape that they were hanging the missing signs with. Yep. That's weird. Yeah. So what happened? Well, Casey Anthony got off. They found her not guilty. And so that's what's scary is you can have a case that seems very open and shut. And it, I mean, it's so obvious her mom killed her. But I was watching an interview with a juror today, uh, just trying to do a little research for this. And she just wasn't convinced that, that Casey killed Kaylee. She said that the prosecution just didn't make it clear that it was murder and not an accident. Yeah, so in seeing all that, you see that it's a whole conglomerate of things that go into each case. Right. So selection of jurors, uh, charges, like what you're charging them with, can you prove what you're charging them with? Right. Um, and, and just things like that. Yeah, and she acknowledged that the circumstantial evidence against Casey was really strong, but she needed proof that it was murder. So they found her not guilty. And she also said if they were not going for the death penalty and she had been charged with other things that they could have convicted, they would have. But according, she she felt like that the jury instructions they were given didn't, the evidence presented did not line up with first degree premeditated murder that warranted death. Yeah. And um, I mean, everything about this stunk. I mean, after, um, Kaylee was killed, Casey was out partying and went out and acted normal. Yeah. But the juror said in the end, you know, speculations and opinions about Casey's behavior, it wasn't enough to convict. So, in a situation where I think Rob Wood could get some kind of a plea, if he wants to go that route, he may not need to go that route. We don't know what evidence they have. Yeah, that's the thing. He's sitting there and he knows everything. Like, yeah. he has it all in front of him. He knows what he has on each person. So it's easy for him to sit and, and say all that. But for us, we don't know all that. So then you get all this, you know, is he going to do this? Is he going to do that? And that's why we're speculating. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it, here's the thing, too. Let's say that, that the prosecutor could get Lori to flip on Chad. I think one or both have flipped at this point. That's just my gut. Um, I I just, it eliminates one other trial from having to happen, which is good for the family, which is good for the state. You don't have to worry too much about, um, getting these mixed testimonies at separate trials and, and two transcripts and that sort of thing. Cause right now they're not co-conspirators. They, I mean, they've been named as co-conspirators, but they don't have a joint defense. Yeah. And for us, we want to see her sit in the courtroom and have to listen to all that, um, you know, everything that's that's went on and listen to the testimonies. Like, we want her to have to do that, but uh, we right. don't know. Right. From a selfish perspective, I want this to go to trial, both, both of them to go to trial, and I sit there and watch them squirm and be uncomfortable and have to face in public what they've done. Yeah. But... A plea deal assures a conviction. Yeah. You are you know that person is going to do time. And it's not left up to 12 citizens. I mean, you can get stealth jurors on there. What if you get one person that sort of thinks Lori was brainwashed and they don't feel like she deserves to go to prison for the rest of her life? That's the things that can happen in these cases, and we've seen it with Jody Arias when we were in Arizona for the retrial, the penalty phase, we were waiting on that verdict to come down. And so I remember we were at a coffee shop talking to some people. We get the text verdict's been reached. We run to the courtroom and we just are like, there's no way they're not going to give her death. One juror was the reason that she got life in prison. One juror. And, um, I think later on it came out that, uh, Juan Martinez had prosecuted her husband. I think this was before they were married. And also that she was a victim of domestic violence at some point in her life, which when you're doing jury selection in that case, because it was a domestic violence situation, um, I would assume that the 
uh, defense doesn't want any domestic violence uh, or the prosecution may not want a bunch of people on that jury who's been a, a victim of domestic violence because you're sort of, um, you have this pre predisposition. Yeah, to you're going to you, show sympathy to... To how you feel yeah. about it. Yep. Um, and, and that woman eventually got death threats. Um, it was a big deal. Well, um, yeah, and that goes back into what we were talking about everything that plays a part in selection. So because they didn't ask the right questions, um, they missed, you know, removing her. Right. As a juror. But so again, kind of going back to it, if you get one person that has followed this case from the beginning or gets on social media, and let's say they were a member of that, there was a group before the bodies were found. It was what free Lori Vallow on Facebook. And it seemed to be people that supported Lori. I mean, you're going to want to know if you're the prosecution, if that person had been in that group or if you have somebody, because that could just indicate that they are sympathetic in a way. Um, what, what I think could be a huge problem for the prosecution is trusting what Lori says as true. You mean she doesn't say <laughs> truthful things? I mean, try not to pass out from shock, but, Ooh. you know, I, I think there, that would be one of the biggest problems that the prosecutor could have in a plea agreement with Lori because what does she do when somebody, you know, makes her mad? Yeah. And then you have Chad, on the other hand, who was having an affair with his wife and who lied about the kids and yeah. so, all that stuff. So they're both liars. Yeah. But for Lori, I mean... We know she has to be super short on money at this point. Yeah. We don't know if, if Mark Means is already doing it pro bono or what. Um, but, I mean, that's an incentive for Lori to want to make a plea deal. Is she doesn't have the money to fight this. And this is the first of many charges. We know there's charges coming from Arizona eventually. Yeah. But and th And that's the thing. There's so many charges in this case that they're not getting off. No, they're not going to get off. And uh, so that sort of is one of the things that makes me say, if the prosecutor can secure a, a plea deal, I think he knows that, that there's no chance. Now, it could be Chad. I mean, Chad could be striking up a deal. We don't know which one. We're just talking as if maybe Lori, because she waived her preliminary and Chad didn't. And he seems very involved in his defense. And um, so we're just sort of assuming that maybe it could be Lori. And we know by his, by Pryor's questioning that he's trying to distance himself from her. So is that because he knows she's flipped and turned? I don't know. I mean, it could be. We just, there are so many unknowns that um, we're just here to speculate. I mean, it, here's the good thing is let's say Lori does take a plea. She can't appeal. Yeah, that's she, true. She throws her appeal out the window. She has to take that sentence and be happy with it. At this point, I believe the felony charges are five years maximum apiece. So you're looking at 10 years, and we anticipate more charges coming down the pipes. But let's say that they theoretically, um, and I don't believe this to be the case, but let's say they really can't tie Lori to more than what she's tied to now. Um, knowing that there are charges coming from Arizona, I'm sure Wood knows if there's charges coming for Tammy or Joe. If he knows that maybe the most they can get is 10 years for her with the charges she has, then it does maybe benefit him if she flips and he can get her to testify against Chad, knowing that with the other charges, she's never going to be free. Yep. And and besides the murder and stuff, we have other, you know, insurance fraud and, and what else? I mean, there's all kind of things that they, she was taking money, you know, Tylee and JJ's money each month and they were deceased. Yeah. And I, you know, I kind of did like the rough math and it could have been like six to $8,000 a month in, in government benefits between, um, Joe Ryan's death. Um, JJ would probably get social security disability and survivor benefits from Charles. Uh, that, that, I think maybe 6,000. There is a tier and there's a max that you can get from that. So you're looking at 6,000, potentially $6,000 a month from September till they arrested her in February and they found Tally's card on her. So there are so many charges coming that, you know, 
if it's a situation where this case doesn't give life in prison for her, then maybe she becomes the one to flip. Yeah. But then you too get into the judge can hear the plea and he can say no. Right. Yeah. A judge can definitely um, reject a, a plea deal, but I don't think it's usually common that they do because at that point everybody's gotten together and they agree, but it can happen. Um, it won't be Edens. It'll be a different judge this next time too. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I just don't know if it's going to happen. I just know that, that in other cases like this, it does. And just because there's so much media attention surrounding this case, it doesn't make it immune to a plea deal. Yeah. I think they're going to go after the biggest charges for the person that they have the most evidence against. And like you said, we would have known so much more if we had just sat through eight hours of a preliminary hearing today. Exactly. And Wood wants to get both of them. He wants to prosecute both of them to the fullest extent that he can. Mm -hmm. I mean, you saw there was a big hug. Larry gave him a big hug after the hearing the other day. And you know that's what he wants. So, yeah, I mean, they're working and getting all this evidence lined up so they can present the strongest case possible. So if he needs one of their testimonies, would it put an exclamation on what he has? I mean, I assume it would. Yeah, I mean, we yeah, we all know Wood wants maximum for all these kids, all the investigators, the FBI agents, everybody who's been touched by the story and has worked this case. Um, but just in the real world, plea deals happen all day, every day. Um, and I trust that Wood will make the decision that, that he feels is best. Um, I think at the end of the day, we just have to remember whatever happens, um, they're not going anywhere. Exactly. Um, cause I told Fruitloop, I said, our Twitter is going to get lit up with people saying, oh my gosh, yeah. like she's not going to pay for the kids. Oh, she'll pay for the kids. Yeah. And I don't know that these charges are going to be the only charges she faces. There's so much more, but we're just saying that. There are some legal pundits that think this could be the case. Yeah, and we don't know for sure. We're only speculating. Right, and, she, you know, I mean, she could have waived. Let's just say there is no plea or no talk of a plea deal. Um, why did she waive the case, the hearing? Could be. I mean, because Chad's hearing showed that most, it showed pretty much right now what the state has to get him bound over. He was bound over Nine times out of ten, should, well, probably ten times out of ten, should have been bound over anyway. Yeah. And we looked at it, and some people got confused online about there was a, a release of witness list. But you have to remember that was early on when it was the initial charges of abandonment. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about it, and we never, we couldn't find a list for these new charges. No. So people got confused. Well, we would have known, you know, more because of these people were on the list, but not necessarily because we didn't see that list. Yeah. So. Right. And so we never. Yeah. And that's a good point. I have seen that, too, um, yeah. where people are saying, oh, this person was on the list. We would have seen them talk. Well, I don't think they would have gotten any of the family on the stand for a preliminary in something that, that you know, the thresholds kind of lower for a preliminary to get them bound over. You don't have to pull out all your big guns. You don't have to throw the, the star witness on the sand. You just got to prove that the intent was there Yes, to get them over. Yep. Um, Which you could have played the, the footage from the officer's body cam. Uh, and right. That, that yeah. would have been like, okay, yeah, there's enough. Let's go. Yeah. They could have had that hearing and in five minutes, you know, bound her over for trial. Yeah. So the other thing that we were thinking about today is knowing that within four to six months, um, it's likely she's going to be charged with conspiracy to commit murder for Charles. How does that happen if she's serving decades in Idaho? So let's say that the trial for, um, the kids haven't happened and they dropped these murder charges for her in Arizona. So I reached out to my old buddy, Kathy Russin, who's over on law and crime network. Uh, if you guys aren't following them on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, you should do so. I love all the commentary over there. Their shows are so well done and they're very informative. I watch it a lot. 
Um, so just a big thank you to Kathy, but I, I wasn't sure how this would work. And Fruit Loop and I tried to Google. We reached out to uh, a criminal defense attorney and got one part of it, but we had some more questions. So I asked Kathy, what is going to happen if Arizona drops the conspiracy to commit murder charges for Lori in Arizona, but she is awaiting trial in Idaho? And so she reached out to somebody and Essentially, what she said is the district attorneys will talk and decide amongst themselves which state will go first. Um, they may choose which state depending on which state has the stronger evidence. So, okay, with what we know now, what do you think? What would you guess has the stronger evidence between the kids and Charles? Well, Right now, I would say Idaho, just because the bodies were found there. They were murdered. You know, and looking at Charles's, was he murdered? Yes. But they've got to prove that. And so right now, I would say Idaho. Would you really? I uh, I would. I, I think so. Just because of the evidence that they have. Yeah. Um, that's my opinion. But yeah. I what mean, do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I would almost, part of me says Arizona, just because I can imagine text back and forth between Lori and Alex. Um, but I mean, they're not smart and they've left just what we know is a huge digital trail. It's kind of like this, you know, blaring neon sign with arrows pointing to them. Um, I don't know. I, th I mean, I think we just know a little bit more about Arizona. Um, how that was set up and you know we feel like charles was ambushed and none of it adds up the body cam footage seems suspicious and i don't know i mean maybe both so what we're saying is if i'm correct so the district attorneys will get together and say this is what i have this is what i have yeah and then they'll determine where she's gonna go so kathy's um contact said that states do not like to give up their high profile clients to other states. Um, if they don't, they can require that she serve out her sentence in Idaho before she's returned to Arizona on an extradition warrant. Yeah. Well, so that was what um, the attorney we reached out to. He gave an example. Let's say somebody gets 20 years for something and towards the end of that 20-year sentence, then the other state would come pick them up, and then they would go to the other state. So Right. So right now, Idaho kind of has the first dibs on Lori because they brought charges. Um, if there's an agreement, then they could agree, hey, we're going to send her to you guys or whatever. It'll be, you know, interesting to see once the charges for Charles come down, uh, clearly it's going to be before this goes to trial in Idaho. So we'll obviously learn later on what happens. I just, it was kind of hard to find that answer though. Yeah, because the law is so different. Well, I mean, one is different in each state, but we're not lawyers, so. Oh, no, we're not lawyers. <laughs> Nor would I want to be. Nope. No, no, no. I could not be a lawyer. Yeah. I couldn't uh -uh. defend somebody I thought was guilty. Yeah, even though, I mean, everybody has a right to be defended, yeah. I just, it's it's hard for me. Um, if you have, if you're 100% sure, like, you know somebody has committed a crime, and, like, you saw them, like, you saw somebody shoot somebody, kill them, you know, whatever. I just don't understand why it has to take so long to prove it in court. It's yeah. a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of emotion, but that's just yeah. the process. I mean, yep. Um, because the minute that we don't, you know, the legal steps aren't taken in the right order, then somebody walks out free or yeah. there's a mistrial or there's a hung jury. I mean, you know, it's just like, I think especially with this case, with how delicate it is, that is why everything's taken so long. I mean, we know in Arizona, I mean, Charles died last July yep. and they're still maybe six months away from charging her. Yeah. That's because when they do charge her at this point should have happened a long time ago, should have happened last July. Uh, but I'm pretty sure this go around, they're making sure they've got their ducks in a row. I hope. Yeah. 
Um, so we just sort of wanted to do this little quick podcast on that. Again, no indication that there's any plea deal going on right now. Um, but in the event that there is, I think I would be okay with it. I trust the prosecutor. I trust if the families sign off on it, if Kay and Larry and um, Colby and Annie and everybody else sign off on it, um, then I feel, and, and Cheryl Wheeler and the, Charles's sons, you know, you're not just looking at the family that we talk about all the time. Now you're talking about his family. Yep. Um, so I'm sure that whatever is decided, um, it, w- if, they, if they choose to do a plea deal, I'm sure that, you know, Kay and Larry and everybody have talked about it and have agreed it's a good thing. I've seen what these trials do to families uh, firsthand, and it's not pleasant. And um, it, it just um, at some point, the quiet is needed for these families because in Jody Arias's case, I mean, it, it was torture for his siblings to have to sit. And they sat through everything. They were there for Travis nonstop. Yeah. But it took a toll. And you could see it. And it's just a constant reminder when these trials go two and three months. Every day you're living out the worst moments of your loved one's life yeah. in graphic detail. And so for me, I would be okay if, if if the prosecutor felt like a plea deal was what was warranted here. Yeah. I would be But happy. she's still, whoever it is, him or her. They're still going to be in jail. Right. It's not like, well, I'm going to tell you what. They're not going to get out. Right. It's not like I'm going to tell you what happened and they're going to open the doors and let me leave. There are going to be consequences. And I don't think that the prosecutor is going to give her a slap on the wrist. Um, And and this is just on the charges she faces now. We don't know what's to come. I feel like there are more charges for Lori with this case. Big charges. Yeah. And like we said, this may not be, there may not be anybody flipping. He may not be giving anybody a deal. And he may have enough evidence to take them both. And right, and so. the, and then we just wasted thirty minutes of your time speculating. But guess what? That's what we're going to have to do for a while when yeah. all this quiets down and there's no news. And we can say right now, we apologize for taking your time. Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> We took up, we took their time twice. The last podcast was about us, and they're probably like, "Okay, so she got yeah. chased with a wolf mask." I'm done with. Can them. I just say I forgot to add about that? By the way, the signal for everybody to get in their place to give me a near heart attack was when we came around the corner. Fruit Loop turned her lights off. That is true. <laughs> yeah, that's I true. was laying in bed and I thought I didn't even tell them that you had a code, which was flickering your lights to let them know we were there. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, well, how would you feel about a plea deal, Fruit Loop? I mean, would you trust it? It's hard to trust her. I, what she gave me, I would have to have 100% or what he gives 100% validity that it is the truth, evidence to back it up. Mm-hmm. I'm not just going to take your word for it. Like, you better show me some proof that can prove what you say is true. Uh, on either end of it and I mean if they both serve for the rest of their life in jail I mean could it be they take the death penalty off the table I mean if that's what the um, plea is I mean I would be okay with that mm-hmm. um, yeah I agree. In, in my opinion uh, and this is strictly my opinion I think death is too easy for them yes I want to see them spend the rest of their life in jail having to deal with that environment. Right. Um, But I also think, too, sometimes you can get into trouble with juries because they're going to ask you, if the prosecutor is going to seek death, potential jurors are going to be asked, are you in favor or do you have any strong opinions about the death penalty? Are you for it in certain cases? Are you just absolutely against it? I just think sometimes when... A juror may be able to say, yeah, I'm open to it. But I think it also adds a layer of uncertainty when you go in that jury room and then you're really deciding, can I put this person to death? Can my vote, am I going to sleep okay at night? Knowing that this person is going to be put to death eventually. I think sometimes you can sort of get that hesitation in the jury room where maybe one or two kind of back off and say, well, you know, I mean, maybe she was brainwashed and I sort of feel sorry for her. Maybe we shouldn't stick the needle in her arm. 
it it can happen. If somebody thinks that they've been living under a rock. Well, yeah, I agree. I mean, death penalty is just I I used to not be for it. Um, when I started doing trial work and was in the courtroom seeing crime scene photos, um, I, I did change my mind. Now, I do think that it's a huge, hugely flawed system. There are a lot of people on death row that are completely innocent. Uh, we have a case like that here locally where there's a podcast. Um, I'll shoot it on Twitter. Very interesting. Where a gentleman was accused of killing a cop in the 70s here and a friend of mine um, who used to be a reporter, he actually um, was part of the reason this guy did not get paroled. And so this guy came up for parole. He was a model prisoner. There's always been doubt about, did he really do it? Um, and then once, once my friend sort of learned about the case a lot more, he started this podcast to exonerate this man. Um, and now it looks like maybe there was a crooked sheriff in town that, that set this narcotics officer up. The sheriff had had his hand in all kinds of crime, driving criminals from the crime scene. I think that the, uh, the, uh, security alarm guy was in on it. Like, so whenever the alarms would trip, he would call the, the police dispatch and say, oh, it's just a false alarm. But this guy, 30 years on death row, over 30 years. And he was from what it looks like completely innocent. So with that aspect, the death penalty scares me. But in a situation like this where it's probably going to be just undoubtable what they did to these kids, you know, if somebody did this to my kid, I would have no problem with it. The problem is it can scare jurors off sometimes, I think, or make them not want to convict. Yeah. But at the same time, the chances of them being put to death in Idaho are slim to none. They yeah. don't do it very often there. It's just, I don't, I think it's Idaho. I, I, I know Colorado has been a long, long time. We were, I was looking that up not too long ago, but so is it worth, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if he'll seek death or not. Um, yeah. If he did, I wouldn't be mad. Yeah. And you got to think these are law abiding citizens. Uh that are on the jury, so... Right, but they would vet those thoroughly and make sure that at least, you know, everybody on there was was open to it. Yeah. Um, so, jury selection, we were talking a bit about that and how it goes. Um, I think there'll be a change of venue. Yeah, it's going to be tough in that area. Yeah, but, you know, it's not like... I mean, think about it. They they put juries in place for Michael Jackson. They put juries in place for Bill Cosby. It can happen, and it's not that they have to find 12 people who know nothing about the case. It's going to be, can you separate that from what you have heard and yeah. only listen to the facts in the courtroom? Yeah, can you make a judgment and a decision based on what you hear in this courtroom only? Right. You have to separate what you know prior to. And I think in big cases these days with social media, um, I just think it's so much more hard to really vet, thoroughly vet people. Yeah. Um, well, because social media is just, it, it fuels everything now. Yeah. And they're going to go back and look at um, social media posts when they narrow down the list and um, they look at it. Each side will go down and look at posts made on social media. Yeah. I mean, you always have to be, like, on the lookout in these high-profile cases for the fame seekers who just want to be on the jury because it's a big, big case. Yeah. And then you have to watch out for those stealth jurors who may have some sympathy for the defendants. And, um, I mean, that can cause all kinds of problems in, in a deliberation room. Can you imagine what this is going to look like oh boy. with prior? Oh my goodness! Oh my gosh! I I really, 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 really hope that at some point Chad has to switch lawyers. I can't yeah. handle prior. I try not to be mean, but geez, Louise, he's so cocky and like tries to be matter of fact, and I just can't even. Yeah, I yep. just. I, do you ever like not know somebody, but after watching them, you just ah. Uh, I just want to punch something when I hear him talk. Yeah. And he was just so condescending, though. I mean, I don't feel bad about talking about him because he he made me. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all we had, right? I think so. Um, yeah. 
um, we've taken about almost an hour of your time. So wow. Um, we always say we don't have enough and yeah. then we get on here and I was literally sitting on the couch over there and we were talking about the podcast and I was like, I just don't know if it's gonna be enough. Yeah. Um, but we just I mean, there are I've tweeted out the link to this article about uh where the FBI agent speculates on a plea deal. Um, I'll retweet it again tonight just so it kind of goes along with this. So just reading that article, I thought, well, I mean, it's an interesting subject and it is something that may come up down the road. So, I mean, at this point, I think we're just going to start digging back into people or um, backgrounds and that sort of thing. So we need for you guys to tell us what you want to hear about. Yeah. Come on. Because I'm fresh out of clever right now. I'm not even going to lie. Hey, I'm clever. I'm working on mine. I know, right? You got it all together. Yeah. I just, I, I got three kids. So it's like, I can't think about <laughs> nothing too long. Yeah. Especially with Sarah Rowe. She is all up in this room today. I think even you got a little flustered. Dude. <laughs> it it was, she was eating, so she was smacking, and she has to get right in my ear. She pesters me more than she pesters you, I think, sometimes. Like, just picking. You wasn't here when she come in here and put the ice pack down my back. That's pretty funny. I yeah. mean, she's doing exactly what I told her to. Yeah, and then I had to chase her through the house and put <laughs> it back down her shirt. So Yeah, but yeah, yeah, so reach out and let us know some things you're interested in learning about. We're we're looking at some stuff, but your ideas are always awesome because that's what you want to hear about, and we aim to please. Yep. So you guys have a good evening, and we'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody. <laughs>